Revolutionary greetings. My name is Ian Beddoes. I'm National Political Commissar of the Zimbabwe Communist Party. The politics of Zimbabwe is dismal, as it, just as dismal as, as the economy. And we, as communists, believe that there is a way forward. We have our program, which we call Completing the Liberation of Zimbabwe. And we believe that real liberation must be economic liberation, and by economic liberation, we don't just mean taking away the economy from the white minority and giving it to a black minority. We believe that the economy must belong to the people as a whole. And we don't think that that can happen if, overnight. We don't believe in overnight socialism. We believe there must be a transitional phase and what we're calling for is the development of a national democratic economy and what that means is an economy in which the whole people is involved not a socialist economy as such there will be uh, room for productive capitalism but there will not be room for people who want to live by buying and selling money, by deals. We want production, but we want the commanding heights of the economy, government controlled, and we want major nationalised industries with professional management. Not just party members, not even our own party members, but professional management. This is what we're looking at, and this is the way that we can advance. Now, uh, there's a lot of uh, very bad misinformation about, for instance, the Russian Revolution, Chinese Revolution, what happened afterwards, you know, big uh, scare thing. And even we sometimes hear that uh, Mugabe was a communist, which he was not. He was actually an anti-communist. So what we want to look at is how we can move forward. Now, what our view as communist is, is that uh, the big mistake has been the rejection of political theory, political and economic theory. Uh, as communists, we don't talk about politics and economics separately. We talk about political economy. Um, now, the liberation struggle was aided by socialist countries, uh, in particular the USSR and Cuba. We know China helped Zanu, although we, uh, we believe that the original liberation movement uh, in Zimbabwe was ZAPU, and we are very clear that uh, the Zanu breakaway, which happened in 1963, was aided by British intelligence. So. Uh, I don't want to dwell on that at this time, and I'm quite willing to do another uh, broadcast to explain exactly what, what happened. But what we need is a national democratic economy as the next step. Because you can talk about human rights, you can talk about the constitution, but if people don't have work, if the economy is not working, nothing will go forward. The first thing we have to do is to restore production. The second thing we have to do is that having restored production, we must make sure that all Zimbabweans benefit from the improved production. So that's what our view is based on. Uh, at the moment, uh, I'm in South Africa at, the mo at present, by the way, I'm uh, I'm a veteran of Mkontuwe Siswe. I was I'm born in Britain, but I worked for MK Intelligence, was sent to Zimbabwe uh, during the 1980s, uh, at the time of the Unity Accord, uh, to find out what the Zonu PF government was up to, and because uh, Mugabe had blocked I'm going to a way from using Zimbabwe as a rear base, and so we want to know what happened. In the end, I stayed in Zimbabwe and I married a Zimbabwe. My wife is a Sanna ex-combatant, so that's a little bit of, of my background and how uh, 
I got here. But uh, I know many of you are trade unionists. I just want to say that I started my political life as a trade unionist. Uh, I took part in the uh, 1972-13 week building workers strike in Britain. Uh, and I joined the Communist Party in Britain soon after that. I worked with Zappu and the ANC of South Africa in, in Britain. So I've got quite a long history. Um, and I'm now political commissar for the Zimbabwe Communist Party. Now, if we look at Zimbabwe and other countries in Africa, where did we go wrong? Well, I think one of the most important things is we rejected theory. If we look at the formation of the, or the reformation of the Southern Rhodesian African National Congress in 1957, it was done by the workers. The SRANC had started in uh, 1913. It was uh, part of the African National Congress, which was covered all of Southern Africa, not just only the Union of South Africa as it was at the time, uh, Zimbabwe or Southern Rhodesia was part of that. But it was weak, it was not very militant. But in 1957, militant workers took over the, South, the Southern Rhodesian African National Congress and turned it into a fighting organisation. And uh, they chose the leader of the biggest trade union, president of the biggest trade union, who was Joshua Ngomo, president of Railway Workers Union, to be the leader of, of the new organisation. So the new organ, organisation was led by workers. Where did it go wrong? Where did the chefs come in? I think part of it, or a very big part of it, was because we ignored theory. We thought Get rid of the whites, everything will be all right. We'll get some arms from the Soviets, from the Chinese, and then once we get into power, that's it. We've got rid of the whites, everything will, will be all right. Well, that is not what Marxism, Leninism, or we prefer the term scientific socialism, that's not what, what it's about. Scientific socialism is about understanding the economic conditions of the country in which you live, the traditions of the country in, in which you live, and having understood those things and understanding them in the world context, and the world context is changing at the moment, uh, BRICS is coming up, uh, and US and European imperialism is going down the toilet. Uh, so we must find out how we adapt into the new situation. Um, and if we look at how real communists operated, we can look at the early Rus Russian Revolution and what Lenin did in the early stages, because it's quite interesting. Two things I want to talk about. In South Africa and Zimbabwe, we're undergoing load shedding, because there's been no planning in terms of uh, electricity. In 1917, after the revolution, apart from a few rich people who had uh, private generating capacity, there was no electricity in, in the Russian Empire at that time. Immediately after the revolution, civil war broke out, 14 countries invaded, but the Bolsheviks held on. They cleared out all the foreign invaders and they also cleared out the local reactionaries known as the white generals. White not because of the colour of their skin, but the colour of their uniforms. By 1920, apart from some sections in the Far East, they defeated the reactionary forces. So what did Lenin do? He called in a guy called Gleb Krzyzynowski, uh, a Bolshevik, but he was an uh, electrical engineer, very uh, skilled. And he says, I want to electrify the whole country. Now, this is a country the size of the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. If you can imagine a country which would, uh, in size, would encompass uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, D 
DRC, Ethiopia, Nigeria, that's the size of the country that, that you're, you're looking at. And the plan was made and within 12 years the plan was implemented. Within 12 years they electrified the whole country. Within the next nine years, from 1931 or 32 to 1941, when the Germans invaded, they tripled their generating capacity and they built their industry and they built an industry which was powerful enough to build a, what was then necessary tanks and uh, guns, aeroplanes to defeat Nazi Germany. They did it within a short space of time. 21 years. Now how long has Zimbabwe been independent? And we've only seen a reduction in, in, in industry. So we believe in economic planning. And despite the, the racism of Rhodesians, especially after sanctions were imposed, they introduced economic planning. Now this is a very uh, interesting thing because uh, capitalism, which rejects economic planning, has always used economic planning when they're in trouble. Um, the British did it during the Second World War. After the Second World War, the IMF and the World Bank was not the same as it is now. Uh, they adopted Keynesian economics. They didn't uh, turn to socialism as such, but they did say right, we're going to control profits, we're going to push up workers' wages, uh, we're going to control the banking system because we want to restore production. It's only after they restored production and the capitalists said, hey, we, we're not making enough money. So then they started to talk about other things, about making money, and of course making money without production. And this is what happened in Zimbabwe. So, after independence, uh, and this happened across Africa, we gave up Marxism Leninism. Marxism Leninism for the majority, the majority of our leadership. There were a few uh, genuine guys who accepted that scientific socialism is more about building the economy than about defeating the enemy and guerrilla warfare. But they hadn't understood that. What they wanted was assistance from the socialist countries to overthrow the whites and then to take over as the new ruling elite. And bit by bit any ideas of socialism, there was never any socialism in Zimbabwe, whatever anybody might tell you, was, was thrown away. And even basic economic planning was, was thrown away. Uh, they didn't know how to control the economy, so they brought in an expert, Bernard Cicero, who had a thorough neoliberal background. And by 1991, we adopted the Economic Structural Adjustment Program, ESAP, and uh, we threw away economic independence. Uh, economic independence had been, uh, and this is a twist in Zimbabwe political economy, economic independence had been gained by the Rhodesians against the imperialists, but was given away, wasn't even sold, they didn't even sell out. It was given away in 1991 by the Zanu PF government that gave away our economic independence. I just want to talk about uh, the question of imperialism because this is not properly understood, imperialism in, in Africa. Uh, imperialism in Africa was imposed after the Berlin Conference of uh, 1885 when Africa was divided amongst the European, uh, major European countries, uh, everybody getting a slice uh, and that's when imperialism became very serious in Africa. Yes, they traded with slaves and all kinds of nasty things before that, but they didn't actually control Africa. Uh, so, the first armed uprising against imperialism happened in, in Algeria 
in the 1950s and very soon after that in Kenya the Land and Freedom Army otherwise known as the Mau Mau actually killed some white settlers uh, and the reaction of the French and the British was uh, vicious. Many Kenyans were killed, many Algerians were killed, but in the end the French and the British both recognised that they couldn't carry on in the same way. But these wars were expensive for them and also giving them a very bad name. So they adopted the policy of neo-colonialism uh, and that is that yeah, you can have your black president, your national flag, your national anthem, as long as we control the economy, this is what's been going on. Uh, now when they came down to southern Africa they had a problem because the Portuguese were not interested in giving any black person any power whatsoever uh, and this is what happened in Angola and Mozambique and uh, the colonial administrations of Rhodesia and South Africa were not interested at all in, in giving up their administration to black people. But what we should understand, the Rhodesians were not the imperialists. They were a product of an earlier form of imperialism, which the big imperialists, the guys who live in London and Paris and Washington, they didn't need those white racist governments anymore. What they wanted, they wanted black governments which they could control. But they certainly didn't need black governments which were going to introduce any measure, measure of socialism or national economic independence. That they didn't need. So the whole story was about manipulation of, of the process because they recognised that those white racist governments could not uh, could not survive. Now, it, the interesting thing is when they put sanctions against the Rhodesians, the Rhodesians <coughs> created a relatively independent economy, which we inherited for the first 11 years of independence, and which, as I say, we, was given up by Bernard Chizero. Uh, why? Because the Sonu PF government had no idea of how to run an economy and they still don't. Uh, now we're seeing people complain about the Chinese coming in. So why are the Chinese coming in? Our leadership, although they're following the capitalist road, they're not even real capitalists. A real capitalist sets up a factory, gets production going, Yes, underpays the workers and makes a nice profit from each worker and the thing carries on and he's making a lot of profits and the workers get just about enough money to, to survive. That is capitalism. And of course there's a finished product at the end of the day. Our guys don't know that. All they do is loot. And uh, they, in the, at the end of the day they have to bring someone else in to run the industry because they do not know how to organize production and the real capitalist knows how to organize production and if we've got genuine socialism we know how to organize production but our guys have got no idea about that so there was the rejection of national planning which happened in 1991 and the real killer was the slogan, making money makes sense, which happened in the early 90s. And of course, that carried on until 2008. And yes, it did make sense because we all became millionaires and trillionaires. <laughs> but the unfortunate thing is that money was worthless because it was not based on production. And if we look in simple terms at the world economy at the moment, the difference between China and the United States. Why is the, the US economy going down the toilet and bringing Europe with it and the Chinese economy is expanding? It's very simple. That the US economy is based on money. Buying and selling of money, controlling financial markets. The Chinese economy is based on production. 
and the four biggest banks in the world are now Chinese and against what all the economic textbooks tell you those banks are all state owned, they're sectoral banks one dealing with agriculture, another with industry, another with trade, that kind of thing and they're now the biggest banks in the world and by the way they give loans at low interest rates to Chinese industry and sometimes outside of, of China so if we want to move forward production must come first production must be central to everything we do before we can have production we must have infrastructure to some extent roads and railways but more importantly electricity and water those are the essentials so we need a national plan and this is what's at the center of uh, of, of everything that we're talking about in Zimbabwe. Now we come to the opposition. Uh, with the introduction of e ESAP, uh, we see that uh, the trade union movement became very worried because real wages were starting to go down and by around about 1995 there was talk about the formation of a workers party which was opposed to neoliberalism but then what happened because again there was lack of political theory of political and economic theory by the time that the MDC was formed they, who was the economic spokesperson Eddie Cross an extreme neoliberal who's now a big fan of uh, Emerson Munangagwa so, uh, and the MDC became, because they were getting money from the West, they became the spokesperson for the West. Uh, Mugabe had fallen out with the West over the Congo War. And by the way, sanctions did not start after war veterans went on the land. They started before that. They started precisely because of the Congo War. And uh, if you read Sidera, you'll find that out. And uh, unfortunately, the MDC historically has told uh, people a lie that sanctions are only against individuals. It says total lie. If you read Sidera, you'll see the sanctions are against the whole of Zimbabwe. But there again, uh, the Rhodesians manage very well under sanctions. Iran has managed very well under sanctions. Cuba. Has, uh, under, with no natural resources to talk about has got a very good health system a very good education system under sanctions so as much as we must be opposed to sanctions and we don't think the USA or Britain has got the right to put anybody under sanctions in the world nevertheless uh, if we'd have adopted correct policies when the sanctions started, instead of the black elite continuing to loot, we would be in a different position at the current time. So uh, this is this is the state we're in. But what we're saying is we need national planning, and we need to lock into the fact that the world is changing, US and British uh, uh, rule of the world, France as we can see in West Africa is really a problem, so we need a new way forward and uh, I'm afraid Chamiso with all his quotation of biblical verses and his love of Zionist Israel is not going to take us anywhere and we know that uh, Zonopiev hasn't taken us anywhere uh, the, it's now become a, a party of the looting class we need a new beginning